So welcome to our Frequently Asked Questions series. My name is Chris Shelley. I'm the lead pastor at Lampier Church of the Brethren, and I'm joined today with Scott McFeet, lead pastor at Refton Church, and Josh Marcroft, uh, the youth director at Lampier Church of the Brethren. And the question that we are addressing, it's our last question for this series, is should Paul be considered the architect or the creator of Christianity? So how come Paul gets all this credit, you know, when there's obviously there's like lots of other disciples that could have written and uh, contributed to the gospel? How come Paul? Why Paul? Big deal. He did write a lot of the books we have in the New Testament. Yeah. 13 or 14, depending on... Yeah, we would say 13, because we're not sure who wrote Hebrews. Right, right. But even atheistic scholars would say he at least wrote seven of those 13. Um, But, yeah. Yeah. So So he he wrote a big chunk. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so I guess the question is, so then is Paul in his writings since, I mean, that's what, you know, you hear a lot of teaching and preaching coming out of Paul's writings along with the gospels. But I mean, there's four gospels. There's maybe 13 letters of Paul. So Mm -hmm. Paul gets a good chunk of what you hear in church on a Sunday morning. Although Luke gives him a a run for his money. I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, if you combine Luke and Acts, they're actually longer uh, right. than have, all of yeah. Paul's writings. I have. More words. Yeah, there's more words. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's that is fun fact. Fun, fun fact. fact. <laughs> that is true. Um, but okay, so so I guess the kind of the question is then which really came first, right? So did was Christianity on the stage before Paul, or did Christianity come of Paul? Maybe it should be Paulianity. <laughs> So which so which came first? Well, do you want to start with a definition of Christianity? Well, sure. I mean, I guess if we're going to say like, okay, what is Christianity and was it on the scene? Well, then what exactly is Christianity? So that's good. Yeah. Um, the the Lexham workbook, theological workbook dictionary, um, says that Christianity is the the beliefs, the practices, and the expressions of Jesus and his teachings. So that's Christianity, the the teachings of Christ, of what Jesus said, and the expressions of those teachings. Um, Which means how we live, how how we we live live them out. Teachings. Yeah. 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 So, so, you know, what we, what we believe about Jesus and how he taught us to live and modeled for us. Was that on the scene before Paul? Or was it Paul's writings that launched Christianity onto, you know, the the Roman platform that eventually led us into what we know now today as Christianity? Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Which, which which came first? Well, I mean, we can start with uh, Acts eight because that's where we see uh, Saul at the time. This is pre. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul's conversion from Saul to Paul. Uh, Acts 8. Saul is the one that is persecuting and and ravaging uh, the church. And I would be hard-pressed to say that he's ravaging nothing because it says that he's ravaging the church, which means they had to be following something. Uh, And they they had these practices and beliefs, as you talked about, as a definition of Christianity that they believe, which was causing Paul and those who were commissioning Paul to persecute uh, these people. Yeah. uh, Acts eight says Saul was in, was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And they're talking um, about Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women, and he would put them in prison. So, I mean, the the point that you make is, so who is it that Paul or Saul is ravaging and dragging off if Christianity did not exist yet? 
Yes. And this is pre, I mean, we're going to jump ahead here just for two seconds. This is before Saul becomes Paul, yeah. who becomes the writer of all these things. Sure. So there's a conversion well, that even, happens. Well, even in that, you know, why do we think that they started calling him Paul? It's because everybody knew Saul and mm-hmm. everybody was afraid of Saul, you know, what <laughs> Saul did. Um, so, yeah, kind of gave him a new designation there. Yeah. Um, continuing in, in Acts, if we look at the next chapter, we see here the conversion experience. Mm-hmm. It says in verse 1, Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues to Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, I like how that's written, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The words of Jesus Christ speaking out against Saul um, for him persecuting and breathing threats of murder um, to the church, uh, which is neatly written as the way here. Um, so you get this, there's an experience here where, where Saul meets Jesus and, and has a conversion to what then? Right? So if, if Paul was the creator of Christianity, what is it then that he's converting to at this point? Right. Right. Yeah. You know, um, so I don't know how far, I don't know exactly where we want to go with this, but I'm just thinking like, here you have a guy who we know is, was a Pharisee. Right. So he's a Pharisee of Pharisees. Mm-hmm. Um, he was actually taught under the rabbi named Gamaliel. Uh, we see Gamaliel, I believe it was in Acts chapter 22, mm-hmm. where Paul says, hey, I was, I was under, I studied under this, this guy. But we also see him in Acts chapter 5, mm-hmm. uh, where uh, Peter and, you know, they, they, were, they were healing people in the name of Jesus, and, and uh, they're brought before the Sanhedrin. And that's, you know, official church leaders. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to decide, what do we do with these guys? Well, Gamaliel was, was one of them. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think I have it here. If I can just bring that up. Yeah, Acts chapter 5 says, starting at verse 33, mm-hmm. uh, these leaders wanted to put uh, Peter uh, to death, uh, but a Pharisee named Gamaliel a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered that the men be put as, put outside for a while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel, consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Some time ago, uh, Theudas appeared claiming to be somebody and about 400 men rallied to, uh, to him. He was killed and all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. Then he gives another example and, you know, this guy appeared and then, you know, he was killed and all his followers were scattered. And uh, so he says in 38, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, in the case of, of these men who are uh, healing in the name of Jesus, leave them alone, let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it'll fail. But if it is from God, you're not going to be able to stop them. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. So uh, some scholars who lean more toward atheism or actually saw a a rabbinic scholar uh, say this, he would say, "Why why would Gamaliel be behind Paul and telling Paul, hey, go out and persecute these Christians, uh, because it, 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 Paul does claim that the leaders uh, of the church, the, the Sanhedrin, were telling him to do this. Uh, we read that in Acts chapter 22. But why would Gamaliel get behind that when here in Acts chapter 5, earlier, uh, he's, he's making a case like, hey, don't do that. Just leave him alone. Um, and, and I think that a couple things could be said of that. You know, people change their minds. So there, there might be that, but there also might be the fact, well, I say fact, there might be the instance where, 
hey, uh, Gamaliel, we tried your way, you know, back then mm -hmm. with Peter and I believe it was, was it, uh, was it John? Doesn't matter. Yeah. Peter and another guy. I'm sorry I'm blanking out right <laughs> sure. now. It happens. Uh, <laughs> um, right. You know, hey, we tried your way, Gamaliel. We left them alone and look what happened. They're still a problem. So maybe, maybe, who knows? Maybe Gamaliel was still like, hey, we should leave him alone, but he got outvoted. Yep. You know, because it does say in chapter five that uh, he convinced uh, he, his speech persuaded them in verse 40. So at that point, Gamaliel persuaded the leaders to not kill Peter and uh, another disciple. Mm -hmm. um, but in Acts chapter 22, where Paul is on trial, uh, maybe he wasn't able to persuade. We don't know because it's not actually said there, but. I just wanted to bring that out because some people will say, well, that doesn't make any sense. You know, Paul's making this up. Well, why would, why, first of all, why would Paul make any of this up? Um, and second of all, I, I don't think that that argument about his teacher um, saying that he would never let Paul do that. I don't think that flies. Mm -hmm. right. So, uh, so that, that's kind of Paul's life mm -hmm. prior to conversion. You know, yeah. this man is, is, bent on uh, not only just killing Christians, but er eradicating Christianity yeah. uh, because it was causing trouble, you know, quote unquote, for, for the Jews. Um, and, you know, Paul's like, look, I'm willing to do something about it. I'm zealous enough to go out and physically do something about this. But Jesus stops him in his tracks and is like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And, that, and then that's where we pick up there. Right. Yes. Thank you, Scott, for all of that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we see, at least in a timeline type, we see that there was Christ followers yeah. that Saul is persecuting. And then we see that in this timeline, he has a conversion experience where he himself comes face to face with Jesus Christ mm -hmm. who speaks out against him. And then we're going to we're going to look here in a minute at what happens to Saul now Paul's life. We'll look there in a minute, but this question of whether Paul created Christianity or not um, or whether it's Paul continuing the the faith of Christianity, it's not it's not a new question. There are there's some people have brought up that there may be issues with which was written first, even. Mm -hmm. Like, if we want to look at some of the dates of these writings. Um, for instance, uh, we had talked just before all of this that, you know, some people might say that, well, Paul's writings, especially like Galatians being considered one of the earliest of his letters, yeah. was written or predates some of the Gospels. And so some of the theories that have been out there have been, well, then the gospel writers kind of took Paul's writings, which were on the scene first, mm -hmm. and maybe used that to sort of formulate a, uh, their gospels of Jesus Christ. So meaning, who influenced who? Right. Did Paul influence the gospel writers, or did the gospel writers influence Paul? Or who, who influenced who in this? Yeah. And so... Do we want to look at just some of those dates and some of those issues? I mean, it's just it's one particular issue, but I think we should at least so, address so it. You, so you mentioned that, you know, uh, Galatians may have been written in like the 50s. I think you said that. Uh, 48 is one, is is, it 48? Is one of the earliest okay. writings we've seen. So. Yeah. So, so, you know, a lot of his writings were late 40s into the 50s, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of them do actually predate the Gospels. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you date the Gospels? Because some, uh, I think we, we looked it up, that Mark was right around 60 A.D. Is that, does that sound um, right? Earlier, 50. Early was 50s. it 50? Yeah. Okay. 50. So yeah. Mark being the earliest gospel. Right. There's a, there's a particular view that I hold to as well, but there's a, there's a particular view that Mark it was one of the, more of the, the very first of yeah. the gospels. Mm -hmm. And some of the other writers used Mark's writings. To Matthew sort, and Luke. Matthew would have used Mark. Yeah. Would have used that yeah. as sort of a, a foundation and then told more stories mm -hmm. or shared more of Jesus life. And but we yes. Do, and we do know that Luke used multiple resources. Right. 
So, I mean, he says it right out in, in the first first few verses. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, so, yeah, so we have Galatians maybe being as early as 48 AD. Yeah. And then we have the Gospel of Mark, though, also being probably 50. So it's right around day. the same time. Right around the same Technically time. Technically after. Right. But, you know, some scholars date, like, Luke and Acts pretty late. Right. The latest I've seen which I don't even know how they get there, is uh, anywhere between 80 A.D. and 120 A.D. Yeah, and that's pretty that's so 120 late. A.D. <laughs> is super late. I, I only found one scholar that attested to that, and he was the rabbinic scholar that I was looking at. Right. And you and, said he didn't And he even, didn't explain it. Yeah. He just t- he taught it as fact. This is how <laughs> so it is. That's it. Right. Yeah, and it's like, mm, I don't think so. Anyway, uh, there is a debate. You know, there's an early debate and a later debate as mm-hmm. as to when Luke wrote Luke and Acts. And by the way, Luke well, Acts... It's like, how old is Luke then, right? If that's oh, yeah. like um, 40 or 50 years after Galatians, well, right? You're like talking about like how old is he's Luke? He's old, yeah. yeah. Right. Which, you know, if, it, if he did write in the 80s to the 120s, I believe at that point, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul would have been dead. <laughs> right. So... Yeah. Yeah, yes. but but what I'm what I'm trying to get at here is um, there are two camps to this discussion. Yeah, uh, we need to recognize that Luke wrote Luke Acts. Luke right. Acts is is one like work, one literary work. Right. We split it because it it makes sense to right. us. Right. Um, so when did he write it? Uh, typically, the discussion revolves around did was it around. Was it before 66 A.D., which was the Jewish revolt, and you have right. 70 A.D. was when there was a siege around uh, Jerusalem. The, uh, the Romans, you know, came in and overtook the city. Was it before then or was it after then? And it all kind of hinges on what we might call a, a prophecy, you know, because Acts does talk about this siege, mm-hmm. but the scholars that tend to lean more toward non-believing scholarship they would say, no, this is a historical, like Luke is including this because it had already happened. Uh, and those that are believers are saying, no, 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 this is just like any other prophecy. It hasn't happened yet. Right. Uh, in fact, they even compare it to one of Jesus' uh, prophecies that we know hadn't happened yet. But anyway, uh, the majority of, I think the majority of the scholars mm-hmm. land on an early date, yeah. which you're looking at somewhere around 60. Yeah, somewhere yeah. around 60. And I'll contend yeah. with that. I mean, if, it, if it's as late as even 90 AD, Luke is also potentially dead mm-hmm. by that point. Yeah. Because we know in Colossians and in Acts that yeah. Luke is actually with Paul. Yeah. So, again, this is just to help us put a timeline together. Yeah. On Christianity, Paul, Luke, when are these writers on the scene? That's really what we're trying to do in this part of the discussion. So if I look at Colossians chapter 4, it's the end of Colossians. I'm looking at verse 10. What we see is the kind of people that Paul surrounds himself with. These are the kinds of people that he disciples, that he is with. Um, He says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you greetings. Also Barnabas, his cousin Mark about whom you would have received instruction if he comes to you and welcome him. I mean, that's we can talk about that another time, but that's pretty cool that Mark is mentioned here. And also Jesus, who is called Justice. They are my fellow workers in the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, meaning that they those were Jewish. Um, those are Jewish disciples of Paul's. Mm-hmm. Then he goes, Epaphras, who is one of your number, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, sends you his greetings, always always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers that you may stand perfect and fully assured with all with the will of God. And I testify that he is in deep concern for you, for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician sends you his greetings and also Demas greet the brethren who were in Laodicea and also Nympha and the church that's in her house. I mean, he goes on about these greetings, but what I want to mention is you got these guys, Aristarchus, Barnabas, Mark, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas. Luke, the physician, is with Paul. So you're looking at 
they're alive around the same time. Mm -hmm. That's why I kind of say like, well, if we're looking at a date of like 80 AD to a hundred and something, doesn't make sense. I don't know how he would still be alive even at that point if he's already out and he's the physician um, with, with um, Paul. But we also see, does someone have um, acts? I do. So, so not only does Paul say, Hey, I was with Luke. Luke says, hey, I was with Paul. Right. So we have a two-way attestation there. That's great. So Acts 16, starting at verse 6. Remember, you know, Luke wrote this. He says, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Verse 10, here's the key. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And it, and it keeps going. Uh, there are many of these we passages right in luke and that's saying luke is saying look i was there i was there like i don't i don't need you know other people to tell me what happened because i was there right so that's you know verse 11 from troas we put out to sea and sailed straight for samothrace and the next day we went on to neapolis i mean you know luke was there with paul so right so for timeline's sake yeah like those guys did ministry together yeah yeah no, I, I do love that. It's, you know, if I were to write something to somebody about, you know, this is Chris writing and I'm with Josh and Scott, you know, I'm going to write we. And we have here, we know that Acts is, is Luke's writings. And so when he goes from that first person singular into a third person or a first person plural and saying we. Yeah, first person plural. Um, we, you know, and, he, and including Paul in this, all of this um, journey. So we are like, oh, so Paul says I was with Luke. Luke says I'm with Paul. And so we can put together that they are together. Yeah. So Luke's writings talking about Paul. I mean, Luke and Paul were likely doing many of these mission trips together, these missionary journeys together. So just kind of putting the timeline yeah, and, you know, and uh, just for fun, I would say if you look up, uh, sorry, Acts 16, verse 10, your Bible might actually have a footnote there and talk about the we passages because this is this is pretty well known mm-hmm. uh, because there there are several others uh, after this that might be worth looking up if, if you want to. Yeah, so, yeah. Not no. us, but <laughs> those of you watching. So. Right. So what we're what we're concluding here about this part of our conversation is that from a timeline perspective. Jesus came, died, rose again, and left. And from at least that point forward, the church began, or, or Christianity became a movement, or a Jesus movement had started, where people were you know, following the teachings of Jesus. There was a movement, and then Saul became a persecutor, a Jewish persecutor of Christians. Um, so the church came first, Christianity came first, then Saul is mentioned, has a conversion experience, gets renamed Paul. Um, now, it wasn't like after Paul got knocked off his horse, he immediately began to go preach Jesus to everyone. Because it this kind of is like, so, so where does Paul learn what he knows and what he shares about Jesus Christ. Where does he get that information from, right? Because at this point, all we know is Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And then he says, get up, you're going to go, um, and you're going to take this message to the Gentiles. So Paul's commissioned by Jesus Christ mm-hmm. to go share the gospel, but does he know yet what the gospel is? Mm-hmm. So I think let's look at that. There's a timeline even for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I can yeah. dive right There's in. There's a couple Go- places to look, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, man, Galatians 1 is okay. a great place for this. Starting at verse 11, just to get this, just to get this on, the, on the table here, uh, 
you had mentioned like, well, how did, how did he even learn the gospel, right? Did right. Jesus just come down and, uh, on the road to Damascus and teach him everything right then right. and there? Well, check out verse 11 in Galatians 1. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. When did that happen? Did that happen on the road to Damascus or, or right. what? So, I, I mean, we're, if we could go through that timeline, I think would be, would be helpful. I don't know if you guys want to pick up. I mean, we can go back. You want to go back to Acts maybe? Yeah, that would, Acts, that would be helpful. Like Acts. Like with Ananias. Nine. Oh. Yeah, we can look at Acts nine. Because we see that, yeah, there's a couple days where he spent um, just in Ananias' care. Yeah. But even with, you know, the Lord, you know, speaking to Ananias even before Paul came, I thought it was really interesting. If you look yeah. at Acts 9, verse 10. Verse 10, starting mm-hmm. in 10. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. So this is uh, a little bit of context to Paul being in Ananias' care. Mm-hmm. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias na- named Ananias, come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is, cho- he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles mm. and the kings and the children of Israel. Uh, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. And so... Ananias, Ananias, well aware of Paul and his activity in persecuting the church, persecuting uh, those who who call on the name of Jesus and recognize uh, Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, but God is, God is outlining here for Ananias that Paul is one that is chosen by God uh, to preach the gospel uh, to the Gentiles. This isn't necessarily something that uh, Paul chose to do himself. Right. It's something that God right. has uh, chosen Paul for. And so so Ananias departed uh, and entered the house, picking up in verse 17, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Mm. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, taking food, and he was strengthened. So even after Paul's, or Saul's conversion, uh, he doesn't, he's not immediately going out and preaching right then and there. You said he's under Ananias' care for, for several days, and even I know when we go back to Galatians 1, there, there's an even bigger timeline of Paul waiting and, and learning and, and kind of looking back at scripture so that he can understand this gospel so that he can take it to the Gentiles, which is what God has chosen him to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Acts 9 verse 20, this is, this is, it seems like it's right after several days, um, after Saul had spent with the disciples in Damascus, Mm -hmm. it says that once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the son of God. Right. I mean, he had this incredible experience, it's blowing his mind. You know, he can't help but but he can't Jesus keep it in anymore. Like, like like Acts Acts four and five. You know, yeah. that's what that's what they that's what was said about them. Like, they couldn't help but keep it in anymore. Jesus is the Messiah. Um, now and and then people were just astonished, and they're like, "Isn't this the guy that used to persecute us?" You know, like, yeah. come on, hasn't he come to here to take us prisoners? Uh, yet, verse 22, Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled 
the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, it does say, verse 23, after many days had gone by. Now, I'm not 100% sure where this happens, but you mentioned Galatians. Back to Galatians. Um, Paul talks about his previous life, Galatians 1, verse 13. You have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, here it is, my immediate response was not to consult any human beings. Isn't that interesting? So he's like, look, you know, I, I, I learned that Jesus himself is the Messiah, this long-awaited Messiah that all Jews are still, you know, hoping for. Right. Um, how did he learn? Well, Jesus planted himself you know, right there on the road to Damascus and showed him. Uh, so Paul kind of had a, an advantage there. Um, but yeah. he says, look, what I learned did not come from hu human origin. He received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. You know, the theory is here that Jesus is literally, uh, you know, walking Paul through all the scriptures that Paul was so familiar with. And when I say scriptures, I mean the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew the scriptures inside and out. You know, he was taught by the famous Gamaliel that we already mentioned. Right. Um, and I think this was blowing his mind that Jesus actually is the Messiah that they had been hoping for. Right. And he's struggling on the inside probably because he's like, oh my goodness, like I was killing them. I was putting his followers in prison. I was, what I was doing to them, I was actually doing to Jesus. You know, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Right. Right. Um, so I think he's he's going through some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> to put it lightly. Yeah. yeah. Right. So he says, my immediate response was not to consult any human beings. Verse 17, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't go up there and was like, guys, guys, uh, okay, so I just found out this Jesus thing is actually real. Right. Uh, tell me more. Teach me. Right. No, he didn't. He didn't do that says he went into Arabia and then he later returned to Damascus. So what's he doing in Arabia? Right. My theory, and I don't know yeah. if this is true, but my theory is his world was rocked. His worldview was rocked. Right. Uh, you know, imagine everything that you were taught from childhood as true and you believed with all your heart and you were so zealous. Uh, he, he, <laughs> so to speak, unhitched himself uh, because of his experience right. with Jesus. Yeah. Uh, he, he, what's that? What's the word now? His, his faith needed to be deconstructed and rebuilt. There you go. Because he's looking at all these Hebrew scriptures and be like, oh my word, this is, this is talking about Jesus. Absolutely. That's my theory as to what's going on in, in Arabia. And then later he returns to Damascus. Yeah. You no, know, I, I think that's a, a valid theory. Um, only because even from personal experience, I know that like as someone who becomes a believer myself, that then suddenly looking at all of this through this lens of this is all about Jesus, who now I have personally met, who is like part of, you know, like I accepted, you know, salvation into my life. Having now a Jesus lens to read through this, this then blows my mind. Yeah. yeah. And I think for Paul, having all of this, knowing all of the, as well as he did, a Pharisee of Pharisee, as yeah. you said, and then suddenly realizing that on, on every page is a, a massive arrow pointing to Jesus, the Messiah, and the coming kingdom, I'm sure he had to do exactly as you said, yeah. to deconstruct all of his previous preconceived notions of what the Messiah would look like and take Jesus and that Jesus lens and throw it back into what he already knew. I love how you're using the word lens. It's, it's occurring to me like, okay, so what happened to Saul when he first saw Jesus on the road to Damascus? <laughs> like he's blind. Right. Mm -hmm. He's blind, yet now he sees. Now and he sees. and when, when Ananias laid his hands on him, the scales fell off of his eyes. Right. 
literally and figuratively, Damn, the scales right. fell off his eyes, and he's seeing this whole thing in a new light now. Right. Um, he's 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 seeing that arrow that you're you're saying. Right. And those who have Man. eyes to see, let them see. That's right. And ears yeah. to hear, let them hear. And now, Saul, Paul, can finally see and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. <laughs> um, so, he, so yeah, the story doesn't end there. This, yeah, I was going to say, there's more to it than that. I think that was a great, I think that's a valid theory. And so, but that's not it. He's not done. Right. Yeah, it says uh, Galatians 1, verse 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas, who is Peter. Peter. Uh, to get acquainted with Cephas and and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. Okay, so imagine having this life-changing experience, seeing Jesus face-to-face, being blind, scales then are falling off because he has this conversion experience. He's baptized. He goes down to Arabia. He's, He's learning more like... You know, oh my word, seeing the scriptures as if he's reading the Bible again for the first time. Um, And three years later, now he finally goes up to Jerusalem and he's not going to present himself in front of everybody. He's like, I imagine him meeting Peter and James in like a back room, like, guys, like, (laughs) this is still three years later blowing my mind. Like, I, I need to confirm with you guys now. You know, because what I learned was not from human origin. So now I want to confirm with you guys. You guys are, you know, pillars of the faith. I want to confirm with you guys, like, what, you know, what I'm getting here is 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 real. And um, so that's my assumption as to what's happening during those 15 days there in verse 18. Um, but uh, he says in verse 20, I assure you before God that what I am writing to you is no lie. In other words, I mean, you know, He's not, he's not making this up. Okay. Uh, this isn't, it, 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 it seems incredible. It, it is incredible, but he's not making it up. This is what happened. Verse 21. Then I went to Syria and Sicilia. Uh, uh, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith that he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. Then, after 14 years. After 14 years. 14 yeah. long. Why, like, why 14 years? Like, why did it take so long? Why couldn't he just <laughs> hop in the bus and go up to, you know, Jerusalem again? Actually, no, he was in Jerusalem. It seems like he just takes this big 14-year circle and yeah. <laughs> comes back to Jerusalem. Right. You know, so he's going from town to town. Eventually, he goes up to Jerusalem again. Mm-hmm. This time, he takes Barnabas with him, and he also took Titus. Verse 2. Mm-hmm. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet, not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, (laughs) even though he was a Greek. So, like, Titus wasn't compelled to be like the Jews out of my preaching, out of Paul's preaching, right? right? This this matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Jesus Christ and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment mm-hmm. so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Now, here, here we go. This is the good stuff. Verse 6. And uh, as for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God doesn't show favoritism. <laughs> right. I don't care if your name's Peter. I don't care if your name is James. You know, whatever. Right up, yeah. God does not does show matter favoritism right and he says but those those people they they added nothing to my message i i presented to them you know what i'm paraphrasing here i presented to them the gospel that i was preaching Mm -hmm. and they added nothing to my message because there was nothing to add on the contrary verse 7 they recognized that i had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised just as Peter had been to the circumcised, mm-hmm. for God who was at work in Peter and as, as an apostle to the circumcised was also at work in me as an apostle in the Gentile, to the Gentiles. Right. James, Peter, and John, those esteemed as pillars, pillars of the faith, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. So these are top-notch leaders in the church, and they're Absolutely. saying, 
they gave the right hand of fellowship. In other words, we, we not only approve of what you're preaching, we affirm, we recognize that God is you, clearly using you. Mm-hmm. Go, go forth. You know what, though? Just remember the poor when you do go. Right. <laughs> and, and Paul's like, great, that's, that's my passion too. You know? right. So, you know, his message, uh, that the message that he was preaching was, you know, not only revealed to him by Jesus, but then affirmed by those pillars of the faith that many years ago or years afterward. Um, and this message that he's preaching is not original to him. In fact, if I remember correctly, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, in the first few verses, he says, look, uh, this, this, message, what ha- this message has been passed down right. to him. It's not something he made up. It's not something he invented. It was passed down. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm throwing know, that one on like you. but trying it just, to help you out. Yeah, it just came to my mind. It was 1 Corinthians 15. Yeah, I think 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 3. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, Mm. that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So it was something that he received and something that... Not something he made up, not something something he received. That's right. And I think that's, I mean, that's so key even to what we're reading in the, like kind of this historical account that we're given in Galatians is, is how much of it, has been given to him or passed on to him. And I even love that between him and these three pillars that neither one of them are adding or detracting from the gospel. So what Paul is preaching to the Gentiles is the same thing the pillars are preaching in Jerusalem. And they would have spoke up if, if he was. Oh, sure. If he was preaching yeah. something that wasn't quite right, I, I fully believe, I mean, just looking at the rest of the New Testament, they definitely would have spoke up. Yeah, right. They're all the time calling out false teachers or even, what was it? Was it Apollos who wasn't quite teaching right? So, so two, like a brother and sister in Christ mm-hmm. kind of took him in and said, hey, here, here it is. Here's mm-hmm. like, you know, so all I'm saying is they, they would have. They would have. They would have corrected him. Right, so Paul is not preaching anything that's different from Peter. Right. Peter wasn't preaching something more strict or less strict than Paul. They're, they're, te- they're preaching and teaching the same gospel everywhere they go, which is what Jesus has done. That's right. Just to two different audiences. Yeah. And I think that's going to play a, a big key point later is the audiences mm. um, and how we look at these texts as we move forward you know audiences are the israelites it's the context israelites the gentiles. versus gentiles gentiles, yeah. gentiles are just people that are not israelites pagan polytheistic so the world the world <laughs> the rest of the world that is not yeah. a yahweh yeah believers of yahweh yeah okay so we understand this is this is great historical context of paul his conversion he explains how he received the message how he then went 14 years later back to um, share with the pillars of of Christianity back in Jerusalem and how no one is preaching something other than Jesus and Jesus alone um, and what he has done. Okay. So, but we don't, we have a couple letters from Peter. We have you know, something from James. Yeah. But what gives Paul authority to write scripture? Right. Where does he get off, I guess, writing this? Does he know or is he aware that what he is writing ends up becoming part of what we call the word of God? Yeah, well, there's there's probably two things that I want to touch on here one is so we touched on the fact that paul has the most amount of books written in our uh, new testament even if he may, doesn't have 
as uh, many the, words. The most amount of words. Luke's that, got them. Yeah. That, <laughs> that Luke has. Um, and by all accounts, I think you said this in our pre-recording conversation, Scott. It it's the closest thing to systematic theology that we have in the New Testament, and and in a lot of his letters. Mm-hmm. He's giving a discourse uh, and instructions on how people are to act in church. And so is Paul just making this stuff up? I mean, we already said that he is not making up a new gospel. Right. Um, but is Paul making up these actions and these uh, positions like elders and deacons right. uh, mm. that, that he's instructing the church to do? Because I think maybe sometimes that's where people might start to question Paul and like, okay, we get that you're, you're preaching the same gospel as these other guys, but like, you seem to be adding a lot of stuff here. Like sure. that churches are supposed to do. You're supposed to throw this person out of the church. You're supposed to welcome this person in. Right. Um, but so as, as you mentioned in Galatians uh, one, he spent about three years or so studying scripture, or at least that's the theory yeah. that, that you, that you posed. Yeah. And, I, I think I happen to agree with that, that this was a time when Paul was was going back through the Old Testament and and seeing just how much uh, it pointed to Christ. As you said, it was an arrow pointing directly to Christ. Mm-hmm. And and so Paul, Paul doesn't forget this when he starts to write these letters to these churches, the fledgling churches that he had planted. Um, I found... 268, and Scott actually did me a little bit better uh, in his research, um, <laughs> thanks to, to Lagos. Lagos software. Um, Lagos is great. Helped. <laughs> little plug for Lagos, you can get a free version. Look it up, lagos.com. There you go. Super great Bible software. Bible software, yeah. 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 Better than Google or Wikipedia. Or Way better than Google. Better than, that, than those two. Yeah. For sure. um, and so, so Scott actually found... Uh, 300 over 300 direct quotations uh from the old testament that are in paul's letters and paul only wrote no no i'm sorry that's new testament yes new, new testament. testament 308 in it, uh, 308 quotations of the old, old testament, testament in, in, the in the new testament in the new testament i yeah. could have i could have searched paul's letters i didn't think about that okay but i think well then i found i think maybe that's where so maybe it's more like 260 260 which is what uh, the original number that I had, um, but Paul Paul isn't making this stuff up. It right. Christianity as, as once Paul understood Christianity, this religion that he was persecuting, once he understood it for what it was and Jesus as the Messiah, a continuation of Judaism, and so yeah. these these principles and uh, positions. Even I think you mentioned that in the synagogue. They had elders and, and deacons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it, um, Yusto Gonzalez is um, one of the, I guess you would say, one of the authorities, at least on early church history. Mm. And one of the things I I loved about um, his fifth chapter in his book, he began it by writing that the, that the early Christians did not see themselves as starting or originating a brand new religion um, in the first century. That what they saw Christianity was, was a continuation of the Jewish belief that they already were familiar with, with the exception, the major exception, that Jesus Christ was the Messiah who came and died and paid the price for their sins. That's the only thing that separated them, which made them from more than just a sect of Judaism was that they became this group that believed that Jesus came and died not only for their sins, but for the sins of the world. So that's what turned them from just a sect of Judaism into a whole new worldwide religion eventually. But that they believed that the, there's really only one difference between them and their Jewish ancestors now yeah, because Jesus came. And so they had this, which I think we, as, as we're far removed, Western and American Christians would have been more Gentile than anything. We have a hard time, I guess, reading this and looking at this and thinking like all of this was written in a Jewish context because Jesus was a Jew. The gospel came first to the Jews and the early Christians were 
Messianic Jews who saw their faith only being continued, not tossed, changed, rewritten, just continued, and the Messiah has come, and, and which, igno- which is inaugurating the, the beginning of the kingdom, which way they were hoping for. Yeah. So anyway, that's... Yeah, and so all that to say is that Paul, in these letters and his instructions and, and how we are to act in the church is not something new, just like the gospel that he was preaching is not something new. Um, it's a continuation of Judaism and something that they already would have been familiar with. And then maybe, so the second point, and this is getting more directly uh, an answer to your question, where, it, where is Paul's authority? Mm-hmm. Um, whenever somebody asks me that, I, I always go to, to Second Peter, um, it's in his closing, his closing chapter, his, his final words uh, to them. So it's Second Peter 3, uh, chapter 14, uh, and we'll read through 16. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Mm. And so mm-hmm. maybe it'll come a, as comfort to some people that we're not the only ones who have trouble <laughs> right. understanding Paul because right. it's hard to understand sometimes. But, but the big takeaway here comes at the end of verse 16 when, when Peter equates Paul's writings uh, to the other scriptures. Other scriptures. And so that would imply that Paul, and it says here, Paul knows, and, and it's according to the wisdom given to him. Mm-hmm. So it's not wisdom of himself. He's not just making this, this stuff up. This is wisdom given to him by God. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but Peter equates this uh, to the other scriptures. And and this is going to get into how we view the Bible right. um, as a whole. But in Second Timothy, uh, I'll probably just turn there. Uh, sure. Sure. Just because so, it's better to hear it from, from the word than from me. Uh, Second Peter. Second uh, Timothy? Second, Second Timothy. Timothy. Yep. yep. Three. <laughs> Three, 16, 16. Seven, through 17. All scripture. So this is the scripture that... Peter was referencing as well as Paul's writings because we just established that Paul's writings are scripture. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So scripture Mm -hmm. is not just a man-made thing. It's not something that man just puts to paper. It's breathed out by God. God is is the author of his Mm -hmm. word, and, and he used men to do it and, and there's the the personality and characteristics of the men who wrote the in the, in their writings to, so it's not like god was just using them as a robot to, right. to write these things down but scripture is god breathed and, and mm-hmm. as a result we we see the epistles that that paul wrote as being god breathed and mm-hmm. so the authority isn't given to paul by paul himself or by any other man not even by the pillars of the faith, uh, as we alluded to earlier mm-hmm. with Peter and well, James. Peter would be one yeah. who writes. Peter, <laughs> being a pillar of the faith, is writing that Paul's writings are scripture. But yeah. Right. Right. But it comes from God because it's God-breathed. It's God-breathed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I wanted. To, yeah. I just wanted to add real quick that, you know, some people, how do I say this? Uh, one option for interpreting verse 16 there. It, for all scripture is hey he's only Paul's only talking about the Old Testament mm. but even if you go that route which I I would say that's probably what Paul is talking about um, but even if you go that route Peter is still recognizing Paul's writings mm. as, as scripture. scripture so and if Peter's recognizing that the church the, the early first century the authority church, that Peter has yeah, yeah with the authority that he has but you know they're all they're all recognizing Paul's letters as scripture. 
So even if you go that route, I just want to, it's a little caveat. Just, yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people might be at home might be thinking, yeah, but I thought that was only talking about the Hebrew scripture. I think you're right, probably, but still we have Peter affirming yeah, Paul's right. writings. So Right. And it is important that we view all of this, maybe 40 plus authors or 40 plus writers, but one divine author. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think th there is, there especially, and I, you know what, I think we're going to see this more and more. I'm just going to say that. I think we're going to see this more and more is that there's going to be people, they're going to want to piecemeal the word of God and say, you know what, I like, I like Matthew, I don't like Luke. I'm going to teach Paul, or I'm not going to teach Paul. I'm not writing, I'm not going to cover the epistles. I'm not going to do Timothy and Titus, you know what, because I don't like what they have to say. I think we're going to see that more and more as our world becomes more and more yeah. divided and secular. But the idea is, it's all God's word. All of it. Divine. Yeah. And so we should approach it at, at least as such. And I think that's kind of what you were getting at. Yeah. It's, it's, this isn't like, oh, it's it's this guy and, and that guy and this person. They have their personalities, but it's God's words that are being written into this yeah. page. And it, that's why it has moral authority yeah. in our lives. So that there's a, it's, when you start to take that apart though, there becomes issues where it's like, well, now no longer do I think that um, Paul's writings to Timothy or James's letters have moral authority over my life anymore. That's what yeah. that's the problem of unraveling that thread of saying, well, I like James, but I don't like Paul. I right. like Peter, but I don't like the Gospels. You know that kind of thing. You know that's uh, <clears throat> that's definitely a modern day issue, but it's not a new issue. No, uh, I'm not. I'm not a huge church history buff. I'm I'm still learning, but uh, Marcion comes to mind. Is that? Do you guys remember that? Man, briefly. I'm sorry. I mean, just a small. Sorry, I brought that. You up. threw in this up, but I mean, I'm like, I remember like a heresy. I'd have to go look this guy up, but I, I believe if I'm right, he's the guy that picked and chose like what he wanted. He 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 put his own um, version of the what we would call the Bible together, mm -hmm. but he he pulled a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. So. Right. And he was just like, yeah. nope, these are the only inspired words of God. Yeah. But. So yeah, there's that. And I'm afraid that like we will, that's what will happen as people begin to, to do that, where they look at the scripture and they say, or even just, you know, like even today, I think we will hear people say, I like the red letters. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. I don't like the rest of it. Like I, only the things that Jesus said, and that's it. Um, yeah. So anyway, I think you just have to be careful of that because it's, it was never expected or never to be like, well, just the red letters and just that, the New Testament, but all of it. Isn't that the idea of kind of like, well, Jesus taught love, Paul taught obedience. I know you were talking about that earlier. Yeah. So I think this is going to, you're leading me right into the next, you're the welcome. next big question, <laughs> Scott, is aren't these guys so drastically different, Jesus yeah. and Paul, right? So you know, you, you right. So it wasn't Jesus all about love and we see Paul all about rebuke or it wasn't Jesus all about forgiveness and Paul was all about correction. Um, these are like the kinds of things I think people didn't, didn't, wasn't Jesus a, a missionary running to sinners and Paul was all about church discipline. I mean, so these are some of the, like the, the, uh, use the word lens again. These are some of the lenses yeah. that people use to separate Paul from Jesus and say, you know what? I like Jesus. I don't like Paul. Yeah. So, so what do you guys think about some of those? There, these are maybe not as popular as I think they are, but these yeah. are some popular thoughts that, Hey, you know what? Jesus was all about love, forgiveness, um, and, and reaching the lost. And Paul was all about correction, rebuke, and he was very by the book. Well, and Scott has a great resource to show that this is not the case. Yeah. I, I first, I feel like I wanted to say that, um, you know, if, if you're at home and you're watching and you're thinking, but yeah, but that's, that's what I think. Like you're describing what I think. Well, sure. like Jesus. Yeah. He's love. And Paul was more about obedience. I think you said, right. Yeah. Uh, Jesus was more about forgiving. Paul was about rebuking. Um, you know, I, I want to say as, as 
compassionately as I can is that is a, that is a misunderstanding mm-hmm. um, of Scripture. Right. Um, and I think it kind of comes out of what you were talking about earlier, how we sort of segregate Scripture a bit, you know, and like, oh, well, the Old Testament, that we don't need that anymore. And, oh, you know, we only need the New Testament. It's, it's, it's different. And, and yet, as you said, you know, the New Testament quotes the Old Testament so much. In fact, I've read, I've read scholars that have said you would be hard-pressed to find a New Testament verse that doesn't somehow allude to an Old Testament verse. <laughs> but is there anything new in no. the New Testament? <laughs> Not really, no. In right. fact, it's, uh, some scholars will say, no, you should just call it Older Testament and Newer Testament, <laughs> right? That's good. So, but yeah, uh, so I, I just, I just want to shed a little light sure. on that misconception. Yeah. We're, not, we're not saying, you know, wow, how, how, could you, how could you ever arrive at this conclusion? No, I mean, that's, that's kind of a natural tendency, I think. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have this book that has 66 different books or letters inside it. Sure. It's kind of like, well, they're all, you know, it's sort of a natural thing we, we do as modern thinkers. Well, even I was just even thinking about, like, w- the most common track that's a that's a like a scripture or like a, an evangelistic tool a track that we give people in in evangelism is the gospel of john right yeah mm-hmm. so they fall in love with the gospel of john and the jesus portrayed only in the gospel of john and they're like oh man i like this guy at least the way john portrays him but then what happens is they think that's the only thing that we know about Jesus. And then maybe they discover Mark's version of him. Maybe they discover what Paul has to say. And they're like, whoa, that is not the Jesus that I learned about yeah. in John. No one explained it to me other than giving me this scriptural evangelistic tool. Yeah. And that's what I'm left with. Yeah. It's not like you're getting different. You said, you said versions. Yeah. Like Mark versions. is a different version or it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily you're getting different versions of the story. You're getting more of a fuller idea, picture of the story. A perspective. Fuller perspective. Different a clear, emphasis. A clearer right. lens. Different. If, yeah. if that, because the thing is, the, the New Testament writers, well, and I would say even the Old Testament writers, their goal was not to set out and give us like the most factually accurate biographies ever written. Like We would love that. That would be great. But that's not that wasn't their their goal. That's not their writing style back mm-hmm. in those days. Um, we would love for Paul to have written his thirteenth or fourteenth book of systematic theology yeah. or whatever, right. because then all of our churches wouldn't have to come up with our own. Like, hey, this is our statement of faith. This is what we believe. We could right. all just use Paul's yeah. or or Jesus. You know, if he did that. But none of them do that. Um, so, you know. When we, when we tend to segregate or think like, well, this, this guy had this version and this guy had this version. Jesus has this version. Mm-hmm. Paul has this version. We, we intuitively think, well, one must have gotten it from the other who was first, the chicken or the egg, that kind of thing. And now I'm bringing it back to your, your original assist as you were <laughs> passing the ball to me. Um, yes, I do have an article that I brought up on my computer here from Biola university it's a christian university and uh this article is titled did paul invent christianity it was written on may 6 2019 Mm -hmm. by kenneth birding and he just lists (laughs) boom 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 he goes down bullet points after bullet points of Mm -hmm. of showing where jesus's teachings and paul's teachings actually line up like they're not they're not opposed to each other um so, you know, I'll just give you a few. Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to read the whole document. In fact, <laughs> no, maybe, right. maybe yeah. Doug can and we provide can link a link. it in the video. Yeah, in the yeah. video description. But um, so he says, did Paul invent the idea that we should bless those who persecuted us in Romans 12, 14? Sure. That seems like a something that somebody would say. Absolutely. No. <laughs> he got it from Jesus. Luke 6, verse 28. What about the idea of showing care to our enemies? You know, Romans 12, 18 to 21. No. He taught, Jesus taught us to love our enemies, Luke 6. Did Paul invent the idea that we should give taxes to whom taxes are owed, Romans 13? No, Jesus already replied to a question of whether Jews should pay taxes to Caesar. 
Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, mm -hmm. Mark 12. Oh, man. What, uh, about, what about rebuke, though? What about correction? Did you... Paul invent the idea that we should stop judging each other in Romans 14? No, Jesus famously warned, judge not that you be judged, Matthew 7, verse 1. Uh, and you're talking about church about discipline. Church discipline. Yeah. Did Paul invent the idea of church discipline, 1 Corinthians 5, Titus 3.10? No, Jesus taught that we should warn a sinning brother or sister and then go on to discipline if we must, Matthew 18, verses 15 to 17. Look, so the thing here is that they're, Paul's not teaching a different doctrine or a different gospel. Right. Uh, where Paul comes into play is he's taking what Jesus taught and he's having to apply it into the churches because things are going on. Things are happening right. in these local churches. Paul has to address them. So he's using Jesus' teachings to address them. By the way, the teachings that Jesus actually taught him. So, you know, uh, just to say, well, yeah, but Paul's writings came before uh, the, the gospel writings. That's, that's very much, a, well, it just doesn't hold, hold water. I mean, doesn't. yes, that's true. In but some cases, in some that, cases, in some cases, but that doesn't necessarily mean, oh, well, then Paul made all of this up, right? No, because, you know, when Jesus did the Sermon on the Mount, it's not like some guy was in the back, you know, writing it down word for word. Right. Like what we have is pretty much basically what he said, uh, but it's written it for, like, it, you know, I hope you guys are with me on that, but <laughs> it's not like it's not like word there for word exactly what right a stenographer. Right. That was there just going to town no. while he was on the mountain. These were written later. And, you know, uh, I, I'm thinking like, hey, this would be a great idea. We should write this stuff down because we're not going to live forever. <laughs> you know, right. well, you know, hopefully right. Jesus, Jesus is coming back soon. But we should write this down for generations of believers. Uh, and in Paul's case. It's him responding to issues that are going on in churches. And I think that's a that's a big deal. I think for mm -hmm. for people that are looking at Paul's writings and saying, well, like what I see here is correction, rebuke, it's um, discipline, uh, and the, the reason is in most cases you're looking at letters that are written to a people because of issues that are coming up, like we had just preached through Colossians and the issue with Colossians was you had a, you had a Christian group that was living in a polytheistic world that was beginning to adopt philosophies and religions from the world around them. It was seeping into their belief systems. And Paul spends the first chapters, the first half of those letters, pretty much in every case, giving the theological doctrine and background that then sets him up in the second half of those letters to preach the practical now or therefore, which is a common thing for him to do around chapter two or chapter three or four in each of his letters is to go therefore or so then brothers, yeah. knowing this, yeah. he sets up the whole foundation to basically remind them of what Christ did. Yeah. And then give them the practical application piece of how this gets lived out. And all of it is about Jesus and how Jesus taught us to live. It's like, I love Ephesians is a great example of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. If this was the letter to the Ephesians, here's chapters one through three. Okay. And it's, it's all like teaching doctrine, that kind of stuff. Right. Here's chapters four through six. It's all therefore, you need to do this and do this and do that. And there's right. all these commands, you know, that are really not in the first three chapters, but are now in the, in the chapters four, five, and six, you know, there's this, that therefore is the hinge, yes. you know, that, that ties the whole letter together. And you're, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, these letters are not just about do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. Um, you know, they're just, they're in direct response to the issues of the churches of his day. Yeah. So, but I, I I wish we could bring that up on the screen and like prove that to and everybody. Show you how it is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in in every one of these letters, Paul be, feels like he needs to create a foundation. Yeah. To like a reminder. 
because it's like he's looking at these churches, whether it's Colossians or Galatians or Ephesians. He's looking at these churches and he's he's cl- he's saying like clearly you've forgotten or you've lost like what we initially told you. So I feel like I'm gonna have to rehash from day one <laughs> to the last time that I was with you, yeah. yeah, and do it in a couple chapters worth of this letter. And when I'm done with that, I'm gonna then explain to you what you need to do now. Mm-hmm. And that's. And so that's what we see. We see that part, but we don't see that so much in Jesus because we don't see like the whole theological foundation behind it. But I think that's because the context is different. Yeah. You got Jesus, a Jew who's in Jerusalem mingling with a lot of Jews who's teaching them that the kingdom of God is here. I mean, that's the message. I'm the Messiah. The kingdom is here. Wait, so you're saying in order for me to read the Bible well... I have to understand the context. <laughs> right. No. I'm glad you got on the the, the same page here. Thank you but. for your sarcasm. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> the sarcasm. Yeah. But um, yeah, it the context really does matter. Hey, yeah. I, wanna, I just want to throw this out there. Uh, fun fact: Who? So Paul wrote 13 that we know of, mm-hmm, uh, right. right? Who's the second? Who wrote the second most number of letters? Anybody know? Maybe. John, this is John, a trick. This is a trick question. Oh, no. oh, no. well, <laughs> I don't know. Trick question. So my Jesus. first guess is going to be God. Jesus. He wrote seven. He wrote to the churches. Oh, the seven letters oh, in Revelation. Seven, re- seven letters wow. in Revelation. Oh, okay. And those letters aren't all about love and fluffy <laughs> butterflies. And I stuff. spit you out. That's right. <laughs> right. That's yeah. right. I, I'd rather you forgot you your first love. Cold. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. And he taught about discipline, and we talked. You mentioned that in the Biola. Yeah. Yeah. Um, article, yeah. but in Matthew 18, Jesus teaches about discipline right. and That's how right. to rebuke a brother. Um, so yeah, they're not that radically different. The we see what was radical about Jesus, I think, was his cultural perspective, not his theological or religious understanding. He was a Jew through and through who kept the every letter of the law. Yeah. What was different was he was getting at the heart of the Pharisees, the Sadducees and the religious leaders. He was getting behind the law to the heart of all of those matters. That's what made him so radically different from what they were familiar with. Well, and he's also God. He's also God. So there's that. Small detail. Okay. You don't one up (laughs) me on that one. Um, But Jesus was every like, the question is Jesus radical and Paul's by the book. Well, Jesus was by the book. He was found to be sinless, which meant he That's kept right. every letter yeah. of the law. Yeah. Um, was Jesus all about love? Well, we already said, well, Jesus did teach about love. Paul also taught about love, loving mm-hmm. your brother. Um, and, and offering forgiveness. And that's the other one. Jesus, you know, people say, well, Jesus was so forgiving and, and Paul was all about rebuking. It seems, well, we also know that Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. I mean, you said that one of your new favorite sayings might be <laughs> you brood of vipers, <laughs> you brood of vipers. <laughs> yeah. Right. So Jesus yeah. was also about rebuking and calling people out. And yeah. you know what? Paul, he offered or at least asked for forgiveness for the slave Onesimus when he mm-hmm. returns to Philemon. And so there's a, there's another case where Paul is not, he's asking for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. He's, so to do that, sometimes when we, when we look at each of these characters and we say, you're like this and you're like that, I think earlier, Scott, you said it's, it's kind of like maybe putting the blinders on a little bit or, yeah, yeah. or myopic. Like on a, on a horse before the race. <laughs> or having a myopic yeah. view yeah. of one particular, this is the way Jesus is. He's only these ways. Forget the parts of rebuking. And, and Paul's only this one way. He's, he's never forgiving or loving is to have sort of a myopic view of each of these characters. Hmm. So knowing now that really Christianity came first, Paul is a convert to Christianity, that really what Paul did was was take the message of Jesus Christ and what he taught and take it to a new audience, the Gentiles, um, that the early Christians, and I think Paul as well, saw Christianity not as a brand new religion, but a continuation of Judaism with the exception of Jesus is in fact the Messiah, which of course Jews would mm-hmm. say he is not. Yeah. Um, 
what is our takeaway then? What, are, what, are, what is the thing I think that we want everyone that's, you know, been looking at Paul and Jesus and saying, no, nah, they're too different. They're far too different. What is the takeaway we want people to, to go with? The one that immediately comes to my mind is this whole book here, mm. all of it is scripture and kind of like what you were saying, Scott, earlier, this idea of Old Testament, New Testament, like it, it kind of implies maybe a little bit of such like a stark contrast, old and new, when really that's not the case. It, the Bible tells one meta narrative, one story, um, and there's not a divide between God in the Old Testament and God in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. There's not a divide between what Paul teaches versus what Jesus teaches. Mm -hmm. It's all the same, and all of it is authoritative over our lives. Mm -hmm. um, That's great. When you say authoritative, I know this is a takeaway, but wh what do you mean that the Bible is authoritative in our life? Yeah, I, I mean, because it was written by God and it has that moral, it has the final say, basically. So if we come to it and whether it be culture, our friends, our family, or even our own ideas of what we think is right or how we should be living, and we come across scripture, maybe maybe a particular part that we don't like or we would say that we don't want to agree with, mm -hmm. we have no right to say that we supersede scripture or that, that we can change or, or even go against what it says. It, this has the final say. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that very much goes with maybe my final takeaway is just that, um, you know, there is a tendency to pick and choose what we like. Um, and I think that's where those ideas of, well, Jesus is all about love and Paul's all about obedience. Mm -hmm. I think that's where that comes from. Um, just kind of picking and choosing what I like. Um, I remember a couple, two, three years ago, being back in seminary, and we had to do this project where we interviewed other pastors who were, you know, lead pastors preaching every week. And one of the questions we were to ask them was, have you ever preached through the pastoral epistles? Right? And uh, I was struck by one pastor's response. Uh, so I didn't interview this pastor. There was a, there was a student in my class who interviewed this pastor um, she preaches weekly, and I, uh, she is female, right? Uh, and she, avoid, she avoids preaching Paul. She won't preach any of Paul's letters. Why? Uh, she said that she just doesn't like what he says. Mm. <laughs> you know, and... Here's a pastor leading a congregation who refuses to, to preach through uh, a section of what we consider God's authoritative word for us even today. Yeah. Um, and she's refusing because she doesn't like what it has to say. Now, I, I, would, I would say some of it is difficult. Peter was right. Some of Paul's <laughs> teaching is hard. Yeah. Um, what is Paul? But it's especially hard for us because we're sitting here a couple thousand years later, mm. totally in a different culture, different context. What is going on um, with what Paul is writing? So, you know, that's why, as we've said probably in every video we've done, context is key. Like you, you cannot just pick a verse or a proof text you know, and, and just kind of use that and kind of twist it to your own advantage. Paul called those kind of people out all the time. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's just not, it's not good. Um, but that is our tendency to mm -hmm. kind of use it as our, our proof text book. Yeah. Um, but, you know, my, my takeaway from this is just because we might not like something that's in the Bible doesn't mean it's not true. If I don't feel good about what it says, that doesn't mean that, well, my feelings are true and the Bible, the words on the page mm -hmm. are wrong. 
um, you know, I would, I would suggest that with the difficult passages, maybe number one, maybe there's a disconnect. Maybe there's more work that needs to be done well, on my part, you know, to research the context, to figure out what, what Paul or the, one of the writers is saying um, so that I can better understand what's going on and not make false assumptions and then just throw the, as someone said earlier, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm done with it because I don't like it. So th there may be a misconception. There might not be a misconception. So m maybe he, it says what it says and there it is. You know, I, I often use the example of, you know, Paul says something like, you know, women should be silent in the church. There are definitely differing views on what's going on there. Right. Um, you know, but if, if what is said um, is what is meant, <laughs> you know, right. in plain language, right. then, then we have to make a choice. Like, am I going to conform to what Scripture is teaching me, or am I going to be like this pastor I mentioned and just kind of throw it out and just ignore it? Right. Um, now, you know, I, I hate to throw that out there and just kind of leave the line out there <laughs> and not say anything. Right. Um, you know, I, I have done some research on this. Another day, another time. Another day, another time. But I, but I, I will say I've, I've landed on a particular spot, and it does have to do with the, 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 the cultural context of things. But regardless of where we land, cultural context should right. always play mm -hmm. into it. Uh, and it often involves the Old Testament. So we can't unhitch ourselves from the Old Old Testament. So, you know, did Paul invent Christianity? Uh, did, is he the architect of it? I think we've proven a definitive no. Right. Um, Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess I guess my takeaway is that I, I understand how some some could come to that. Sure. Yeah. Belief, or just opinion. Right. We're saying there's a lot more work to be done. Right. Uh, and don't just don't just sit on it, but uh, you know research it. Do more than do more than look up Google. Do more than look up Wikipedia. I, I threw out uh, logos l o g o s dot com. Look that up. Yep. Great resource. Um, you know, so th there's just it's a it's a lifelong journey yeah. of study, um, and I I just hope that our Assumptions and misconceptions don't lead us mm -hmm. down to a path that eventually leads us away from the faith. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean, since we're throwing out resources now, I guess. Yeah. Again, we've mentioned these before, but there's also uh, Bible.org. Yeah. Um, there's also BibleGateway.com, which mm -hmm. often, which not only has multiple versions of the Bible, mm -hmm. but also has free commentaries to dig deeper. And if you do their paid subscription, which is only like four or five dollars a month, you get like all of their oh, resources. Wow. So it's a lot. Like Yeah. I I did the I did the free uh they give you like a month free trial. So I did that just to check it out and like wow, I mean there's a lot at your fingertips if if you want it. Yeah. So yeah. for the for the cost, what is it, like sixty bucks a year? I mean that's that's not bad. True. That's a that's an Xbox subscription. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then there's so, a there's what I think I feel like is kind of like the glaring obviously is is the phone call to your local pastor. Oh yeah, like because hopefully your pastor has spent already years um, diving deep into these texts and probably has either a digital or physical library sitting nearby. You know, if you have those kinds of questions and you want to dig deeper. And I know most pastors that I'm aware of are also okay with you popping in sometime just to ask questions or just to, you know, discuss and work through things. But not Sunday morning before the sermon. Probably not Sunday morning before no. the sermon. That's probably <laughs> not the most opportune time no. for something like that to happen. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned, and I don't want to gloss over that, is you, you had talked about um, not picking and choosing scripture. And I think that is why I know you do this, I do this. Josh is also um, a part of, is is why we preach a particular way. There's mm -hmm. the expository preaching, mm -hmm. meaning working through a a chunk, a a book or a letter from beginning to end, explaining context, socio, 
uh, rhetorical ideas of what's going on in the culture. Yeah. Uh, doing that the whole way through and well, explaining. I mean, some people do all yeah. of, some people yeah. that are pastors out there only go and pick and choose verses as sort of a landing or a, or an, a launching pad to then share a political perspective. That's the topic approach. The topical approach, yeah. yes. Yeah, so they have like an idea or a topic they want to preach on and then they'll they'll just they have a lot of story and then they'll connect those stories with some scripture proof texts. Right. Now, topical, you know, it's not, not, bad. Not, not yeah, not to go down this rabbit, rabbit hole, but topical isn't bad, but if, if if that's all you're only ever doing, I feel like you're doing a disservice to the congregation. Absolutely. Because okay. you're not teaching them how to read their Bible better, the word of God. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I think at, at the end of the day, that is one of our main goals as teachers and preachers. Yeah. If you're yeah. preaching on a passage, the congregation who just sat there and listened, you know, it's kind of on them. But if they listened, uh, they should be walking or driving home with a better knowledge of how to read that text. Yeah. Not, you know, your funny story that you right. you did 20 years ago. I mean, that's fine. Nice. But like, if you're not getting like actual the exegesis of the scripture that you, that you were just talking about that's that's yeah. not a good thing no it's not so i guess what i'm saying trying to bring the resources and yeah. that particular way of studying scripture um all together to to say basically that, that this is all one story it's pointing to jesus whether it was um looking at the old testament it's pointing to jesus if you're looking at the Gospels, they're explaining what Jesus has done. And if you're looking at Paul's letters, he's not teaching something new that isn't from Jesus. He's teaching Jesus' words and making it applicable to your everyday life. All of it centered around Jesus. All of it breathed by God through each of these authors. It's it's one story. And I think what I want as sort of the takeaway I bring is if at some point you as you study and as you read, begin to say, I don't like this, or this, um, this is causing me to struggle, or these guys are contradictory, more work needs to be done. That's, that's just what I, you know, it's, it's not like you should toss it away, and it's not like you're wrong. What I wanna say is more work needs to be done, because I think you're right, maybe there's a disconnect, maybe there's, uh, maybe you're not understanding the context it was written in. Um, and so just dig deeper and don't be afraid to dig deeper yeah. um, because there's so much here. Yeah. And we said it a couple weeks ago, or I think Scott, you said it a couple weeks ago um, as we were kind of joking about um, the new Testament and the gospels. Um, it says the same thing. Yeah over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. really like yeah. listening to a tape on repeat. Right. That Jesus came, died, paid, paid for our sins, and your life really needs should reflect an attitude um, of gratitude. I, that was said last week mm. of to Jesus and what he has done and be shaped and molded by this. Mm-hmm. It just says the same thing over and over and over again. It does. It does. And yet we have to preach every week. <laughs> yeah, we got to preach every week. Right. Well, because we're sinners. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So I hope that you enjoyed our conversation today. I hope it was was helpful for anyone that's got problems with maybe James and Paul, because that's another debate was whether or not works and faith and, faith works. and, yeah. and what, you know, whether that's your issue or. Uh, maybe you got problems with James and Jesus or Paul and Jesus or however it is that you you would um, enjoy our conversation today and see that, you know what, this is one work. It's God's word, mm-hmm. um, that it was inspired by him, and it's all about Jesus Christ and what he has done. And ultimately, at the end of the day, all of the writers are writing and reminding us um, of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for sinners like you and me so that we could stand righteous before the throne. And if you have any more questions um, about this topic or any of the other topics we've covered, um, I just ask that you would go ahead and reach out to Scott McFeet at Refton Church. Um, or Eric Kerr is not with us today, but Eric Kerr from Willow Street Mennonite Church. Um, or you can reach out to us here at Lampier Church of the Brethren 
uh, you can reach out to me or Josh um, and ask any of the questions that you may have and, and we will help you to dig deeper, help you to research, not just give you answers um, to have discussions with you. So thank you for joining us today and we're gonna take a little break for a couple weeks, but um, hopefully we'll be back with some, some more topics and some more ideas um, in the near future. So thank you and have a great day.